Today, at least the day in which this video is being released, is March 4th. And outside of the fact that March 4th is the only date in the entire calendar that is grammatically a sentence, it also means as of yesterday that the first episode of the Swordsmith Village arc is now premiering in theaters. As on March 3rd, Demon Slayer released their Swordsmith Village arc movie. And while this movie is technically just the 4K remastering of the last two episodes of the Entertainment arc and the releasal of the first episode of the Swordsmith Village arc, it is nonetheless the beginning of the Swordsmith Village arc in the anime. So I figured for the first time since basically I started this page, let's talk about Demon Slayer. Let's make a video that I've been putting off making for almost six months now because it's gonna take a lot of work to make. Because while I've already ranked and explained all of the 12 moons and all of the Hashira, you know what I haven't ranked and explained yet? All the Blood Demon Arts. And considering the fact that Blood Demon Arts are incredibly iconic and play a huge role in Demon Slayer's storyline, the fact that I haven't gotten around to ranking them yet is kind of criminal. Now, the reason that I haven't gotten around to ranking them yet is because... <laughs> There's 21. And when I make a top 10 video, they end up being around a half hour long. So what happens when you have 21 entries? You probably get close to a 45 minute video. And while I know you love watching those, I don't love filming them. And of course, I love filming them. I love my job. It's just a lot of work. But busting my ass is what I do best, especially when it puts a smile on your face. So with no further ado, let's get into ranking and explaining every single blood demon art in Demon Slayer. But before we get to ranking anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And while you're at it, guys, go ahead and follow my brand new podcast, Utaku's Anonymous, that I make with Danny Mata, who is not only probably a bigger Demon Slayer fan than me, but is also going to be accompanying me on a Touching Grass episode where me and him go and watch the Swordsmith Village arc movie, I guess, and make a video about it. So if you want to see me and Danny go see the movie and give our live reactions to the movie and what we've seen, go ahead and follow that podcast page. So Blood Demon Arts, they're as iconic as the breathing techniques that Demon Slayer is known for. As demons by and large can't use breathing techniques, they use their Blood Demon Arts to balance the battles against Demon Slayers. However, where Blood Demon Arts and breathing techniques differ is that Blood Demon Arts are highly individual. You won't see five demons using the same Blood Demon Art like you see five Demon Slayers using water breathing. And because of this, I genuinely believe that blood demon arts are more interesting than breathing techniques. While we obviously do see personalized breathing techniques like insect breathing and flower breathing and love breathing, knowing that every demon we're going to meet in Demon Slayer is not only going to have a very powerful but also unique blood demon art makes meeting every new demon hugely interesting. Anytime a new demon enters the battlefield, you know you're going to see a new ability that the demon slayers are going to have to adjust to. And fortunately, demon slayers never tried to lean on some of the tropes that a lot of shonen anime and manga lean on. That some of the abilities used by different demons, while technically unique, seem more copy and paste than anything. As every single one of the 20 blood demon arts we're going to talk about today is wildly unique. And that's no exception for the first and technically weakest blood demon art we're going to talk about today, the blood demon art that belonged to Susamaru. Tamaru. Now, technically, the full name of this blood demon art is Hayasobi Tamari, but it's usually just referred to as Tamari because the blood demon art revolves around Susamaru conjuring Tamari balls. Now, Tamari handballs are kind of like a Japanese dodgeball. These are simply balls made in Japan starting in around the 7th century that were used for games by children. In the early days of Japanese history, Tamari balls were made out of old kimonos, where the fabric of an old kimono would be smushed together in a wad and then wrapped with other kimono fabric to make a ball. And since Tamaru's case, fortunately, making these Tamari handballs is substantially easier. As was simply by controlling her blood, she's able to generate these Tamari handballs. So Tamaru then uses her insane strength as a demon to either throw or kick these balls at opponents. And these balls, when thrown or kicked by Susamaru, have so much force that by even coming into contact with a limb or a head, blow it away. That is to say, if Susamaru were to throw one of these Tamari handballs at you and you were to try and catch it, it would simply blow your entire arm off. And since Susamaru can grow up to six arms, she's able to use this technique sixfold, meaning that at any one point she can have six Tamaris created to throw at her opponent. Not to mention that she's able to put curve on these balls so if you try to dodge them, they'll still end up hitting you. But at the end of the day, that's basically all it is. She can create balls and throw or kick them at you. These balls are also historically not strong enough to be able to destroy a Nichirin sword, meaning that if you're fast enough to react to these Tamari balls, you can simply reflect them away. Or if you're a demon like Nezuko, you can just catch them or kick them back. The true strength of these Tamari balls actually revolves around another demon's blood demon art. Unfortunately, that demon is next up on our list at the 18th spot, because at the 18th spot, 
we're talking about Yahaba. I know what you're saying. Sutsumaru's at 19, Yahaba's at 18. I thought there was 20 on this list. One of the spots is shared. You see, the true strength of Sutsumaru's Tamari Balls really can't be realized without Yahaba. As Yahaba has a really interesting and really unique blood demon art. You see, Yahaba's blood demon art is known as Koketsu Arrow. This ability is dependent on Yahipa's palms, specifically the eyeballs in his palms. These eyeballs in his palms control invisible red arrows. And when Yahiba blinks the eyes on his palms, he's able to control the direction that these arrows are going. And while this ability might sound relatively low key, it is anything but that. See, from what we've seen, Yahiba is able to conjure as many of these red arrows as he wants. And these red arrows, while technically intangible, can interact with matter, meaning these are invisible, indeflectible arrows. And while they are technically indeflectible because they are intangible, they can still interact with you or anything for that matter. Yahiba with this ability is able to send any type of matter in whatever direction those red arrows are heading. Meaning that if hypothetically a red arrow was to go up through my chin and out of my head, it would shoot me out of the seat directly upwards. Yahiba could then send that arrow back down and slam me into the ground and repeat that over and over and over again, bashing my brains against my hardwood floor until the sun came up. And Yahiba would use this technique in combination with Susumaru's technique in order to change the vector angle of her tamari balls. Meaning that even if you felt as though you dodged one of these incredibly powerful tamari balls, Yahaba could just change the direction of it to head directly at you. And considering the fact that these tamari balls had enough mass and velocity to blow entire limbs or heads off with a simple touch, them having an entirely unpredictable trajectory was very deadly. However, even though Yahiba's red arrows are technically invisible, there is a way to see them. And that's by using the blood demon art of our number 17 entry, Yoshiro. Yoshiro has one of the coolest blood demon arts on this entire list because it's so multifaceted. You see, Yoshiro's blood demon art is referred to as blindfold. And the base ability of blindfold is that Yoshiro is able to create paper talismans that can either reveal something or mask something. See, let's say hypothetically that Yoshiro put a paper talisman on this notebook here. This notebook would disappear to everybody but Yoshiro or anybody wearing a paper talisman on their forehead. Because while Yoshiro can make something disappear, he can also make things that are hidden up here by placing one of these paper talismans on the forehead of somebody he wants to reveal these things to. And it was with Yushiro's help through the use of blindfold that Tanjiro was able to see Yahiba's arrows, which allowed Tanjiro to know how to react. However, if hypothetically Yushiro wasn't there, Yahiba probably would have won that fight. You could definitely make an argument for Yahiba being higher on this list. But Yushiro's abilities with blindfold don't end here. See, while Yushiro is able to mask entire clinics like he did for Lady Tamiyo's or reveal invisible arrows like he did for Tanjiro, he's also too if he places a paper talisman on his own forehead, make himself invisible. And by the time the Infinity Castle arc rolls around to the last arc in Demon Slayer, Yushiro is not only able to make dozens of paper talismans at once, he's also able to make other people invisible, completely masking their presence. But what's even cooler about him being able to mask other people's presence is that those who are wearing the paper talismans can see each other still, meaning that they're only invisible to those they're fighting. On top of that, if hypothetically me and somebody else are wearing a paper talisman, we can share vision, meaning I can see what they're seeing and they can see what I'm seeing so we can use each other's visions to fight better. And on top of that, by the end of the manga, he's also able to use his paper talismans for mind control. Mean that if he places a paper talisman on your head, he can either make you invisible, mask your presence, or control your body. And if he uses this ability against a demon, he can use that demon's abilities. And he takes complete mental and physical control of that demon down to a cellular level. Now, the big drawback for this mind control bit is that he has to be close to the demon he's controlling, which leaves his main body kind of open to attack. But enough about characters everybody already knows. Let's talk about some demons you probably don't know. Most specifically the flute demon. The majority of you who are watching or reading Demon Slayer probably don't know who this is. And that's because this demon only ever appeared in Rengoku's special one shot. That was a spin-off manga about Rengoku as a Kinoe battling against a flute demon. This special one shot was created because everybody loved Rengoku so much after the Mugen Train arc. This flute demon had killed multiple Demon Slayers and therefore Rengoku had been sent as a Kinoe to kill the flute demon. Now the reason that the flute demon was called the flute demon is because its demon blood art revolved around a flute. 
Specifically, the flute demon's ability to conjure a flute that when played and heard by other people would disrupt nervous systems. Think about listening to this song a lot like Tsunade's Chakra Pathway Derangement. Upon hearing this song, if you try to move your finger, something else in your body will move like your toe or your nose, as all of your nervous system signals get rewired. And since moving isn't really something we have to think about consciously, this makes moving almost impossible. Because as somebody tries to walk, they end up flexing their pecs or something like that. On top of this, the flute demon is able to summon two black wolves with its flute. And these black wolves will pounce upon those who've been frozen by the original song and kill them. So the real strength of the flute demon is that you have to get close to the flute demon to kill the flute demon. But if you get close to the flute demon, you'll hear its song and you won't be able to move. And then wolves kill you. And this is a really powerful blood art technique, unless of course you're Ren Goku, who just shattered his eardrums. Because his blood art is predicated on hearing the song, if you can't hear the song, it doesn't affect you. Therefore, as long as you have a pair of noise-canceling headphones, you're gonna be fine. All right, now we can get back to demons that everybody knows. Because coming up at our number 15 spot, we have the Swamp Demon. Now, this is a blood art that I feel is critically, and I mean critically, underrated. The Swamp Demon as a demon wasn't that powerful. I mean, Tanjiro and Nezuko on their first mission as Demon Slayers were able to kill it. But that doesn't mean that its blood demon art wasn't something incredibly powerful and cool. In fact, I would say if you gave this blood demon art to any other demon, it would have made them exponentially stronger. See, the swamp demon's blood demon art is swamp domain, which essentially means that the swamp demon is able to make a pocket dimension. This pocket dimension exists as a swamp that exists below our very own dimension. And this pocket dimension's connection to our dimension manifests through a small puddle. And wherever the swamp demon goes in this pocket dimension, the puddle will follow, which allows the swamp demon to move very stealthily. In essence, the swamp demon can go wherever it needs to go and all you'll see is a puddle. But the Swamp Demon is also an incredible swimmer. And since this pocket dimension is an actual swamp, the Swamp Demon is swimming in this dimension, which makes how fast the Swamp Demon travels in this dimension much faster than it travels in our dimension. But outside of being able to create a quite literal pocket dimension, the Swamp Demon also has the ability to replicate himself. Yeah. The Swamp Demon knows Shadow Clone Jutsu, except as far as we've seen him replicating himself into three clones doesn't weaken the original. And all three of these clones are able to access the Swamp Dimension, meaning that in essence, the Swamp Demon can make three of himself that are equally powered that can all travel underneath our dimension at a much higher speed than your average person can run. And as crazy as this sounds, considering the fact that his first ability is creating a pocket dimension, his self-replication ability is the stronger of the two abilities. Imagine if Akaza could make two more of himself. Goku would have looked more like brass knuckles than a donut. But speaking of Rengoku, we have another demon that he fought in a manga that isn't the original Demon Slayer manga coming up for our 14th spot, because in our 14th spot, we have Hiro. See, Rengoku has not only gotten his own special one-shot, but he's also gotten his own spin-off manga, which is just referred to as Rengoku Story. And the primary antagonist of Rengoku Story Part 1 is Hiro, a former lower rank number two demon. See, Hiro's blood demon art is Umbra Kinesis, also known as the control and manipulation of shadows, meaning that Hiro is able to create and control several different types of shadows with different properties and shapes and sizes. And these shadows can do everything from creating a suction effect that absorbs physical contact, meaning let's say that Hyrule creates a shadow on his face and you go to punch him. Hyrule can make the properties of this shadow a suction force that basically nullifies the attack of your punch. On top of that, he can make the properties of this shadow incredibly sticky, meaning that when you land this punch on that shadow on his face, you won't be able to remove your fist. On top of that, Hyrule, like the Swamp Demon, is also able to control a pocket dimension, and Hyrule uses his pocket dimension to store, well, a lot of guns. See, I'd like to remind you that Demon Slayer takes place between 1890 in 1910, meaning guns very much exist. Hyro has stored dozens, if not hundreds of guns within the pocket dimension of his shadow. And these guns range from revolvers to bolt action rifles, all the way up to a rotary minigun. But these guns aren't created by Hyro, they're collected, they're real guns with real ammunition, meaning that Hyro can and will run out of bullets. However, this isn't really a huge problem for Hyro because the guns are kind of just extra, as Hyro is also able to cloak himself in his own shadows and become a monstrous wolf. In Mind you that the shadows he's cloaked himself with basically nullify all physical attacks and can make you stick to him if you aren't able to cut through him. And in this shadow furry form, he's faster and stronger and significantly deadlier. But apparently guns aren't as useful as we think they would be because he shoots Rengoku like four times and he just 
keeps chugging. So for that, Hyro is at 14. But enough about former 12 Kizuki. Let's talk about some current, well, I guess not so current anymore, 12 Kizuki. Because coming up in our very lucky 13 spot, we have Rui. Rui is lower rank number five of the 12 Kizuki. And while I could very much go on about all of the blood arts that every single one of the spider family had, I'm only talking about Rui. Rui's blood demon art is thread manipulation. This ability allows Rui to create thread from his fingertips. Seems kind of weak, right? Wrong. As Rui is a demon, therefore has infinite blood because of his infinite regeneration, Rui can pretty much make as much thread as he needs to at any given moment, which is how Rui was able to be a master puppeteer of an entire mountain. See, Rui was able to spread his threads across an entire mountain and control people he had turned into demons or spiders from miles away. And while these demon threads don't have the ability of, let's say, chakra threads, whereby simply attaching one of these threads to a puppet, it's able to do incredibly complex things, Rui is able to attach multiple strings to living and or dead demon slayers to cause them to attack other demon slayers that are rushing up the mount, operating much more like an actual puppeteer than anything. But this isn't the true strength of Rui's threads, as Rui is not only able to make a ton of thread, but they're also incredibly durable and sharp. See, Rui's threads have been shown to be as durable and as sharp as Nichiren's swords, as Rui's not only used his thread to block, but also cut through several Nichiren swords. It's shown with something as simple as the flick of the wrist that Rui is able to throw spider webs at people that cube them, making mincemeat out of lower ranking demon slayers. On top of that, if Rui needs his threads to be stronger, he can pump even more of his blood into his threads, giving them a reddish hue. And in this mode, the threads are not only more durable, but stronger and faster. Tie this all into Rui's crazy intellect, where he's able to set traps for people using this ability, and you have a relatively deadly blood art. I mean, not Tsugiyu, who was able to cut through these threads, but still. Coming up at our number 12 spot, we have our shared entry between a demon you know and a demon you don't. Because at our number 12 spot, we have Tamiyo and Ubume. Now, the reason that this is a shared spot between Tamiyo and Ubume is because their blood arts do basically the same thing. Tamiyo is Yoshiro's war, the demon who used to live by the side of Muzan, but was able to break out of his control and is now trying to find a way to break demons out of the control of Muzan. You know her, you love her. Ubume different story. See, Rengoku isn't the only person who's ever gotten a spin-off in the world of Demon Slayer. In fact, there's currently three light novels from the Demon Slayer universe that talk about all of the Hashira, specifically the Hashira before they were Hashira. And in the third light novel, we got to follow around Sunemi as a Kinoe, the rank below Hashira. Ubume was the lower rank number one of the 12 Kizuki. Ubume, also known as Ye when she was a human, was a mother to an only child she loved more than anything. But upon turning into a demon, she became kind of a demon. Her blood demon art is illusion manifestation, which allows her to cast powerful illusions at will, kind of like Genjutsu. I got hot. And these illusions are very powerful. So powerful that Tsunemi couldn't tell whether or not it was reality. Now these illusions are powered up through a thing called the demon dispelling mirror, which is kind of like a conduit for Ubeme to launch her illusions into the world. However, if you hypothetically break this mirror, the illusions become much weaker. Tamiyo's blood demon art is very similar to this, as Tamiyo's blood demon art is blood bewitchment, where Tamiyo draws out her own blood to use one of two different spells. The first of which is Scent of Illusionary Blood, where upon smelling Tamiyo's blood, you are sent into an illusion where you're surrounded by flowers, which is technically a much weaker illusion than what Ubeme was using, but Tamiyo also has Magical Aroma of Daylight, which is essentially using her blood to act as a truth serum. Upon getting her blood into somebody else's body, she's able to decrease their brain function to make them only tell the truth to questions asked. And this works both on demons and humans, though it can end up killing humans. She also technically has a blood demon art referred to as flesh seeds, but this isn't her blood demon art. In order to use flesh seeds, she uses the flesh of a different demon whose flesh she manipulated in order to be able to continue using its techniques after death. So I don't really count it. But considering the fact that Ubeme and Tamiyo's abilities are creating illusions using their blood, they're sharing a spot at 12. Sticking with the theme of female demons though, next up at number 11, we have my ex. Just kidding, they're all fantastic. It's actually Daki. Daki is upper rank number six, a role she shares with her brother Gyotaro. But when it comes to the two people sharing the sixth spot, she is the significantly weaker of the two. In fact, one could say that if it was just Daki, she wouldn't be in the top ranks. It's mostly Gyotaro keeping her there. As Daki gets her head cut off, what? three times during the entertainment district arc, but that's not to say that she's not strong, she is. And a lot of that strength comes from her blood demon arc, 
Obisash manipulation. See, an Obisash is a bit like a belt. It's a large piece of fabric that's used to keep kimonos closed. And while most people just use them to keep their kimonos closed, Daki has different ideas. Because Daki's Obisash isn't created out of fabric, it's created out of her skin and blood. It is an extension of her body. And because these Obisashes are an extension of Daki's body, they are incredibly strong, durable, and sharp when she needs them to be. You see, the true strength of Daki's Obisash is that they can change in terms of their tensile strength. They can be as soft as silk at one moment and as sharp as a Nichiren sword the other. And since these Obisashes are technically an extension of Daki's body, she can make her entire body Obisashes. And since she's a demon with infinite blood, skin, and regeneration, she can make basically as much Obisash as she needs to, being shown to be able to control Obisashes from Kalan kilometers away. But the less Obisash that Daki has out and the closer her Obisashes are to her, the stronger they get. Meaning that if Daki wants to get serious about a fight, she'll retract the Obisashes that she has elsewhere doing reconnaissance. Because mind you, all of these Obisashes essentially work as extensions of Daki's own body. Meaning that the Obisash she has stretched kilometers away allows her to gather intel from kilometers away. And when these Obisashes have all returned her, she is able to slice entire city blocks up in a couple of fell swoops. This goes doubly fold if she has sentient obisashes out. As Daki is actually able to separate part of her obisash from her and give it sentience in a fragment of her power. And these obisashes can go and do tasks for her, like kidnapping and storing people. As Daki's obisashes also have the ability to store people inside of them. And lastly, Daki is able to transmute her own neck into an obisash, meaning when a sword hits it, it is now as soft as silk and therefore very hard to cut, which is theoretically a really good defense against being decapitated, but didn't stop her. But enough about the upper ranks, let's take a step backwards and talk about lower rank number one, Enmu. See, Enmu is the first entry in our top 10. Enmu is kind of the main antagonist of the Mugen Train arc, and is the wielder of the blood art that I would most like to be killed by on this entire list. See, Enmu kind of has two blood arts. However, they work in tandem. Enmu's first blood demon art is Sleep Inducement, where Enmu, through a myriad of different means, I mean, really, there are so many different ways, forces somebody to go into a very deep slumber. And I mean deep, so deep that when Nezuko headbutted Tanjiro, he still didn't wake up. This ability alone own is incredibly powerful, as you could just put somebody to sleep and stab them while they were asleep. Except, of course, the fact that Enmu was afraid that his bloodlust would wake demon slayers from this deep sleep. And therefore, when Enmu is coming up against demon slayers, he prefers to put them asleep from a distance and stay away from their bodies, sending other people to finish the job. However, his blood demon arts don't stop there, as Enmu also has the ability of dream manipulation. Enmu has the ability to enter and manipulate the dreams anybody he's forced to sleep are having, and usually he gives the people in these dreams, incredibly joyous dreams tailored around what they love. That way these people don't try. That way the people that he puts to sleep don't try to wake up, which has a twofold effect. One, it gives Enmu and those who he's recruited to kill the people he's put to sleep more time to kill the people he's put to sleep. And two, it can create a positive feedback loop between people Enmu is controlling and Enmu. As people will want these dreams kind of like a drug, as these dreams are really the only time that these people get to live a utopian life. However, this dream manipulation isn't perfect, as these dreams can be resisted through an insane amount of willpower or by committing suicide. Now, the real reason that Enmu enters into people's dreams is because within everybody's dream is their spiritual core. This spiritual core exists at the boundary of the person's dream. And if this spiritual core is destroyed, it basically kills the person who's dreaming. It doesn't kill them, but it basically wipes out their entire humanity, leaving simply an empty shell. And anybody that Enmu puts in somebody else's dream can destroy this spiritual core. It doesn't have to be Enmu himself. This ability only got stronger when Enmu merged with the Mugen Train itself, growing hundreds of Eyes that if you ever made eye contact with, would immediately throw you into a dream. The only reason that Tanjiro was able to battle against this is because Inosuke swept in and Inosuke wears a mask and therefore doesn't make eye contact with all the eyes. Because if you actually want to battle against something like that, you would have to battle against Enmu with your eyes closed. And while Tanjiro was trying to keep his eyes closed, every time he awoke from his dreams, his eyes would shoot open, which would immediately put him back into a dream. Coming in at our number nine spot is a demon that anime only watchers are about to get very familiar with, Gyoko. See, Gyoko Gyoko is the primary antagonist of the Swordsmith Village arc, and he is upper rank number five. Now, as far as Blood Demon arc goes, I would argue that his is the dumbest, but that doesn't mean it's not powerful. See, Gyoko's Blood Demon arc is called Porcelain Vases, as Gyoko, while he was a human, and still why he's a demon, is an artist, specifically a vase artist. What do you call it when you play with the clay on the wheel? It's, um, 
Oh, Ceramicist. Kyoko's Blood Demon Art ability allows him to spawn porcelain vases anywhere in his vicinity. Does that sound stupid to you? Because it kind of is. These porcelain vases can be any size or anywhere or in any number. The reason this ability isn't stupid is because Kyoko doesn't have legs. What could I possibly mean by that? See, Kyoko can't walk, but he can teleport from vase to vase. Meaning that if Kyoko wanted to walk from here to my hallway, he would have to spawn a vase in my hallway and then teleport to said vase. Now this teleportation is instantaneous. Meaning that for all intents and purposes, Kyoko has flying Raijin in a very, very, very simplified way. Because while Kyoko doesn't have to leave a mark like Tobirama or Minato and therefore can teleport really anywhere he needs to go, he also can't mark people or things. So while Porcelain Vases does give Kyoko a massive amount of mobility, it's nothing compared to Flying Raish. On top of this, like many other entries on this list, Kyoko's Porcelain Vases are kind of pocket dimensions. Pocket dimensions that he can use to store whatever he wants. And let's say hypothetically that one of the vases he makes is as big as my bottle. If he's trying to store something like a human body in this vase, the vase will simply compress a human body down to the size of this vase. On top of that, anything that Kyoko puts in these pots, he has complete and total liberty to control. Meaning that if he were to hypothetically put this pair of headphones in this phone into a vase, he could combine them into some kind of massive headphone phone. Kyoko is essentially god of anything that is in his vases. Lastly, Kyoko is also able to create giant fish-like monsters. And these giant fish-like monsters can wipe out entire villages with relative ease and can't be killed through regular means, but all of these giant fish monsters have a pot on their back. And if you destroy the pot on their back, the fish die. But trust me, you're going to get to see all of this and a whole lot more in the Swordsmith Village arc, which is coming out, well, now-ish. Coming up after Kyoko, we have an entry that people might get mad at me about. Because coming in at number eight, we have Nezuko. While some people will say is too high, while other people say is too low. But I say is just right. See, Nezuko's blood demon art is pyrokinesis, which allows her to generate and control special demonic flames using her blood. Now, these flames only burn things demon related. Things like Rui's threads, Enmu's dreams, Daki's body, so on and so forth. But these flames don't burn things like buildings or humans, meaning that Nezuko could coat an entire city in her flames and only demons would die. On top of that, should a demon get burnt with these flames, it hampers their regeneration ability. On top of that, outside of being completely harmless to humans, they actually help humans. As Nezuko's flames have been shown to be able to burn the poison out of Tengen and Tanjiro's bodies, as the poison in their bodies was demon born from Gyotaro. Now this technique gets stronger the stronger Nezuko is. The strongest we've seen it thus far in the anime is when she was battling against Daki, and she used her exploding blood to create a pillar of flames around Daki. And while I do believe that the multifacetedness of these flames being able to heal and hurt could put Nezuko higher on this list, unfortunately I just can't put her above people like the next entry on our list because coming in at number seven, we have Kyotaro. You see, Kyotaro is also upper rank number six. And his blood demon art sounds a bit stupid when you sit down and think about it because his blood demon art is blood manipulation, which is what every other blood demon art is. But it's not stupid, actually. It's very powerful. See, while obviously every single blood demon art is blood manipulation to some degree, Kyotaro's blood is a bit scarier. See, Gyotaro is able to give shape to and harden his own blood, which is how Gyotaro dual wields his blood Kama. The two weapons that Gyotaro uses are called Kama. However, since Gyotaro is a demon and therefore has infinite regeneration, he has an infinite amount of blood to work with. And therefore, Gyotaro is able to throw blood sickle slashes at his opponents endlessly and at a very high speed. And these blood sickle slashes can take any trajectory because they are constantly being controlled, meaning that Gyotaro has an endless supply of ammo to slash his opponents with. But since this is blood, specifically blood being manipulated by a demon, it can either be incredibly hard or liquid. With Tanjiro saying that if he deflected Gyotaro's blood slashes with his sword directly, his sword would shatter. While at times while Tengen was deflecting blood slashes, they would return to liquid and go around his blades, making any kind of defense against his blood almost impossible. And since Gyotaro has an endless amount of blood that he can create and control, he can create a torrent of blood around him to destroy his entire surroundings or act as a defensive barrier. And not to mention that his blood comma, the sickles that he holds, have an incredibly deadly poison on them. One of which a simple scratch from is enough to kill a human. The only reason Tengen, Tanjiro, and Onosuke were able to survive this poison was Nezuko. So in summation, if you get close to Gyotaro, you have to worry about an incredibly deadly poison. And if you stay far away from him, he can launch multi-directional blood at you that can either be liquid or sharp as a sword. So yeah, 
terrifying. There's a reason he's killed, I think, what, a dozen Hashira? I think it's closer to seven. I honestly don't remember. Coming up at number six, we have another demon that anime only watchers are about to get very familiar with. Because coming up at number six, we have Huntengu, who is also the co primary antagonist of the Swordsmith Village arc. Huntengu is upper rank number four, and he is, at least in my opinion, significantly stronger than Gyoka. You see, Huntengu's blood demon art is emotion manifestation, which basically means that Huntengu was able to make clones of himself that are based off the emotions he feels. And Huntengu can either control these clones or allow them to act of their own free will. The way to activate this blood demon art is for Huntengu to be decapitated, at which point after being decapitated, his head and his body turn into individual clones. And then once these individual clones are decapitated, they turn into four clones. And this is where Huntengu is at his strongest, with four clones. And one of the biggest strengths of this technique is that as long as the main body isn't destroyed and the main body is one of these four clones, it is impossible to kill Huntengu. Meaning you can kill the other three clones a trillion times, and if you don't kill the main body, you're still gonna lose. First of the four clones is Sekido. Sekido is the manifestation of Huntengu's anger, and his ability is Electrokinesis. Yes, every single one of the clones have their own individual blood demon arts. Therefore, Sekido is able to create and control lightning, and this lightning has a wide area of effect, hitting the ground and going outwards, which instantly stuns or incapacitates his enemies. The next clone is Karaku. Karaku is the manifestation of relaxation, and Karaku has Aerokinesis, which allows him to generate and manipulate air. Essentially, Karaku has a giant maple leaf fan made out of skin. And by swinging this maple leaf fan, he's able to level entire buildings in one fell swoop, or crush demons and demon slayers alike under the immense pressure of the wind currents. The third clone is Aizetsu. Aizetsu is the manifestation of sorrow. Aizetsu has an ability known as spear projection, as Aizetsu wields a spear made out of his own flesh and blood. Therefore, Aizetsu is able to control this spear by expanding its reach beyond what one would believe. Therefore, if you believe you've dodged the reach of his spear, he can extend Extend it through your chest. The fourth clone is Urogi. Urogi is the manifestation of joy and has the blood demon art Sonic Scream. With this technique, Urogi is able to make sonic booms from his mouth, the power of which are so powerful that it makes Tanjiro bleed from his nose and ears and stuns him. But the true strongest clone is what happens when all of these clones fuse into one, which is when all of these clones become Zuhakuten. Now, Zuhakuten has all of the abilities of the previous four clones and he can combine them to work together, but he also has wood manipulation, which allows him to control and manipulate the flora and fauna around him, which Zohakuten uses to make the flora around him into five massive dragon heads. Dragon heads which he can control to bite and swallow demon slayers whole. Ooh, I misread. Huntengu is supposed to be number five. Because coming up at number six should have been, and minor spoiler warning here for anime only watchers, I'll give you a second to skip this entry, should have been Kaigaku. See, Kaigaku gets reintroduced in the Infinity Castle arc, and while Kaigaku is incredibly powerful, Powerful, and his battle against Zenitsu is all time, Kagaku's blood demon art is electrokinesis, which for all intents and purposes, Hantengu has. Well, obviously, the application of electrokinesis between Hantengu and Kagaku is vastly different, with Kagaku using electrokinesis to boost his thunderclap and flash and thunder breathing. If I was to sit here and say that Kagaku is stronger than Hantengu when Hantengu has electrokinesis and other blood demon arts, that'd be kind of wild. But yeah, Kagaku has electrokinesis, which we just learned from Hantengu is the creation and manipulation of electricity. However, Kagaku's is black, which is kind of cool. And like I've already stated, he uses it to augment and buff his thunderclap and flash and thunder breathing as Kagaku was a demon slayer before he was a demon. And this simple addition of adding electricity to his sword and his body makes him significantly stronger. As coming into contact with this black lightning cracks, rends, and burns the skin of anybody unfortunate enough to have that happen to them. Considering the fact that this electricity is being funneled through Kaigaku's sword, simply coming into contact with his sword is enough to get yourself shocked. This feels like an appropriate time to remind you that no breathing technique creates the element it's named after, except in the case of Kaigaku. Kaigaku, who's actually using lightning in conjunction with Thunder Breathe. But a lot of Kaigaku's strength comes from the fact that he was a demon slayer. Therefore, he, just like his rank, is upper rank number six. Now to make the very logical jump from six to four. And coming up at number four, we have one of my favorite blood demon arts on this entire list because it's from my favorite demon in the entire show, 
Destructive Death. Akaza is the upper rank number three demon. And as far as blood demon arts go, his blood demon art, Destructive Death, is kind of interesting. See, Destructive Death is a combination of destructive shockwaves with Akaza's Soryu style, which is the martial arts he mastered while he was a human. Essentially, Akaza is able to add devastating air pressure strikes to any of his strikes, be they punches or kicks. And Akaza can either use this to launch long distance attacks, firing off air pressure blasts at people from across a battlefield, or add these air pressure strikes to his up close and personal strikes as the added power and weight of the air pressure makes his kicks and punches significantly more deadly the real reason that akaza uses destructive death is so that he can force opponents to try and come in close as akaza launches a volley of long range air pressure strikes at his opponent all of his opponents make the decision that they need to close the distance and get close to it which is exactly what akaza wants in up close and personal fight however simply with his long range volley of attacks he was able to keep rengoku on the defensive and these air pressure attacks are no joke as they they were able to destroy Rengoku's left eye, his ribs, and multiple of his organs. And mind you, Rengoku as a Kinoe got shot four times by Hairu and just kept moving. On top of this, Akaza has a different form of his destructive death called Compass Need, where upon taking a certain stance, Akaza is able to read his opponent's will to fight, which allows Akaza to react to what his opponent might do before they even start doing it, and to aim for their weak spots, which increases the lethality and accuracy of his blows. Coming up after Akaza is the person who's ranked above him, upper rank number two, Doma. See, Doma's blood demon art is cryokinesis, the ability to control and manipulate ice, meaning that Doma can generate incredibly powerful ice from his blood in flesh. But that doesn't mean that all of the ice has to come from Doma's own body. Doma is able to essentially spawn ice anywhere in his immediate vicinity, and upon spawning it, he's able to manipulate it in any way he needs to. And there isn't some paltry control over ice. Doma's cryokinesis is incredibly powerful, fast, and potent. Outside of being able to control ice like Mr. Freeze, the ice that Doma creates is incredibly lethal to anybody that inhales it. So as Doma is controlling and manipulating all of this ice, the chips that come off his ice and aerosolize into the air, if inhaled, destroy the cells of humans. Meaning that if Doma is controlling ice around you, it makes it almost impossible to breathe immediately. Not to mention that Doma is also able to create ice clouds, meaning that he can fill the entire vicinity around himself with toxic gas, basically. On top of that, Doma is able to make ice miniature clones of himself, which are also able to use cryokinesis. It's a cold way to die. After Doma in the two spot, we have upper rank number one, Kokushibu. Now, some would argue that Kokushibu should be in the number one spot, as his blood demon arc, Crescent Moon Blades, is insanely powerful. However, if we're being entirely real with ourselves, I find it hard to believe that anybody's blood demon art would be stronger than Muzon's. You know, the guy who made all the demons. Oh, I'm sorry, did I spoil the number one spot? But honestly, if you were to sit down and argue that Crescent Moon Blades was number one, I wouldn't blame you because it is incredibly broken. See, Kokushibu uses moon breathing, which holds the most techniques out of any of the breathing techniques in Demon Slayer. With all of the techniques in moon breathing, much like sun breathing, accomplishing very different things. Crescent moon blades are meant to complement this moon breathing style, as the crescent moon blades blood demon art allows Kokushibu to create well, Crescent Moon Blades. See, Kokushibu's katana is made from his own flesh, and therefore it's variable in shape and size, but also can act as a conduit for his blood demon art. And thus, every time the Kokushibu swings his blade, he creates Crescent Moon Blades. Now, these Crescent Moon Blades are essentially blades that fly off his own katana in the way that he swings. They are incredibly sharp and moved in really no scheduled trajectory. Kokushibu's plan with these Crescent Moon Blades is to confuse his opponents, as while he's swinging these swords multiple different shapes, size and speed crescent moon blades are flying off his katana. Meaning not only do you have to worry about his variable size katana, but all of the additional blades flying off of it. And the thing is, Kokushibo technically doesn't even need to swing his sword to launch these crescent moon attacks, as it's just his blood demon art and it's funneled through his katana. So, so long as Kokushibo's katana is unsheathed, he can launch crescent moon blades at his opponents. Not to mention that since Kokushibo has control over his katana's shape and size, he can add additional branches to his katana to make Make it all but impossible to dodge or block. And not to mention, all of these branches coming off of his katana can launch more crescent moon blades. The style of combat that this creates is so chaotic that most demon slayers have no idea how to defend against. In fact, Tsunami, arguably the second or third strongest Hashira, said that if it wasn't for the years that he had spent hunting demons up to his fight against Kokushibu, that he would have stood no chance in playing any defense against the sword play. And just like that, 30 to 40 minutes later, we've made it to our number one spot which I've 
already spoiled. Because coming in at number one is Muzon in his demon blood art of biokinesis. See, every single demon has the ability to manipulate their flesh, but Muzon takes it to a whole nother level. See, Muzon is able to completely rearrange his appearance, the location of his organs, Every. The first time we ever saw him do this is when he was meeting with the Lower Moons and appeared as an adult woman. But Muzan can go far beyond this. When Muzan battled against Yoroichi and was subsequently defeated, he split his body into 1,800 chunks to flee Yoroichi. Now, obviously, Yoroichi was able to destroy 1,500 of these chunks, but 300 chunks survived, and therefore so did Muzan, which means that Muzan has a borderline cellular control over his body. And even if he splits his body into 1,800 chunks, he can control each and every single one of those chunks. In the same meeting with those lower moons, we saw Muzan augment his arm into a monstrous beast with eyes and a mouth that he used to eat the lower moon. However, when Muzan is actually in combat, he turns his arms into whip-like appendages, kind of like the main character from Parasite, and he uses these whip-like appendages to act defensively and offensively, being able to slash anybody around him while also deflecting Nichiren's swords. But it's not just his arms that can become these whip-like appendages. Muzan can create whip-like appendages on his thighs, his back, his chest, anywhere. Muzan can basically make his entire body flailing whips. Not to mention on the end of these whips, he can grow mouths to either cause a suction effect to bring people into his whips or to just eat people. Not to mention that Muzan is also able to make pseudo clones. He can create puppets of flesh and command them. But the most important thing that Muzan can do is why sun breathing was created in the first place. See, Muzan has seven hearts and five brains that are in constant rotation around his body. And this is why sun breathing has 12 forms, as each form is meant to destroy a vital organ of Muzan. At the end of the day, there's nothing Muzan can't make his own body do. Even being able to turn his body into that of a giant infant mode that can crush cars in its bare hands. There's a reason everyone's afraid of him. And that reason, outside of the fact that if you even speak his name, an arm shoots out of your chest and kills you, is biokinesis. And that's it, guys. All of the Blood Demon arts ranked and explained. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, Nick, you left one out. But I'm not even going to risk spoiling that for anime-only watchers. So we're doing 20. Do you guys agree with my ranking? Where would you have put Nezuko? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And yes, my right side light has been dying on and off this entire video. I'm as upset about it as you are.